I will say from experience, technology has not always been my friend. <laughs> but don't you just love the delete button? I do. <laughs> the beauty of writing a letter, or for me, a lecture, um, having the, the luxury of time to think of what you're going to say, to try to get the words right. And if you didn't say it right, if you said something you shouldn't have said, Voila! Delete button. It's gone. Um, you get a fresh do-over. I think in terms of these chapters that we're going through today, oh, would these characters not have wished for a delete button at this place in their lives and what happens? But the story moves on. Our Genesis story is moving on to a new generation. The spiritual baton is passing from Abraham to his son Isaac. We finished up in the middle of chapter 25 with, with Abraham's um, death, I suppose, and then Ishmael moving off the scene, living in hostility with everybody, and we're moving on to Isaac. So interesting thing about Isaac, he is sandwiched between two of the most famous characters in the whole Bible, his father Abraham, his son Jacob, and in so many ways, he just feels like the weak link between the two. We don't know that much about him. We know in his early life that he was definitely a loving, trusting son. He could have overpowered his elderly father trying to tie him down at Mount Moriah as a sacrifice, that he did not that he surrendered himself to that. Think what that says about his heart. Um, think what it says about his heart when he allows his father to send a servant to choose a bride for him. He has no say in that. But when she comes, he does fall in love with her and he is faithful to her. We have no record of any other woman in his life, in Isaac's life. Um, Today's stories are going to fill us in a little bit more about Isaac, some stories that are admirable and some stories that are terrible because God doesn't call perfect heroes and he doesn't give anybody the luxury of a delete button. So we're going to look first at his family and neighbors, where <coughs> Isaac plays into those things. Um, first, we'll start his story out with warfare in the womb. And then the sequel to that, which happens when the boys are about 15, we would guess. Interesting, we're starting out with Isaac, but look who the first story is about, Jacob. So right at the beginning, he's been a little overshadowed by his famous son. The first story is the birth story, verses 19 to 21. Isaac's 40 when he marries Rebecca. He's 20 years older when she finally gets pregnant. A good thing about him, he prays for his wife. When Abraham went to the Lord about progeny, about a child to carry on, he is more thinking about himself being in that line to carry on and God providing a son. But when Isaac goes to the Lord, he's praying on behalf of Rebekah, which is just so sweet. It tells you about his love for her, and it is a reminder of us as spouses to be dutiful, faithful prayers for our husbands. The Lord answered his prayer. Rebecca became pregnant right off the bat. She feels that something is not the way it should be. In a day that there were no ultrasounds, she's feeling something really crazy going on in her womb. Now, she's never been pregnant before, but surely this is something quite unusual. So here's what Rebecca does, which will tell you something good about her. And we're looking for good in everybody today, aren't we? <laughs> so she goes directly to the Lord and inquires of him what is going on. And the Lord reveals to her, and we assume that this revelation is passed on to Isaac and that ultimately it is passed on to the boys. What is happening to me? And the Lord says, okay, beyond just having twins, you've got two nations in your womb, two peoples. One's going to be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. Um, another biblical theme here, the paradigm has developed through culture of mankind. 
that fathers would pass this birthright on to their oldest sons. But God turns that upside down, not just here. He did it from the very beginning. If you look at the Adam and Eve story with their sons and what happened with them and who carried on the line, but he'll do it throughout scripture, choosing David. David was you know, the youngest in his family. So God does this apparently intentionally to show, along with this 20-year wait, that what is happening in God's story is done not by humans causing it to happen by their own will, but by God causing it to happen. He uses miraculous events to show he is the author of this story. He is the one who is providing for it and propelling it. So the first boy is born, verse 25. He's red. Uh, his whole body is hairy. So they name him Esau, which means hairy, H-A-I-R-Y, <laughs> hairy. He's, he's a furry guy. Um, he's also sometimes called Edom, which refers to the redness, his ruddy complexion. And red just keeps coming back in his life. Um, the stew was that red stuff, that red stew, and then where he ends up living, apparently, red cliffs. You could go there today, and it's just red, rugged cliffs. He's an outdoorsy guy. He's a hunter. And here comes the next son, his brother, who comes out holding his heel. And his name is given to be Jacob, which has lots of different names, and they don't seem to connect to each other exactly. But one of the meanings is like supplanter, because he's holding the heel of his older brother as if to pull him back and take his place. So he becomes a visual prophecy, which has already been given to his mother. This is exactly what he will do. He will pull Esau from the expected place, and he will supplant him. But there was a lady in our group last night who has a child named Jacob, and she said something that I had also read, that the name Jacob means God will protect. So what we see in the beginning of his life is his supplanting, and then later in his life we do see God protecting him. Um, Isaac is smitten with the rugged son, which is kind of interesting because Isaac himself is not an outdoorsy, rugged man. He's not a man's man, but he is smitten with the boy who is. And Rebecca has aligned herself probably when she first got that prophecy. Her heart was with that son who would carry on the godly line. You think about her and what she gave up to come to a great unknown, a lot like Abraham. She came in faith that this was what God had for her, that this was the family that God would use her to be a part of. And she is doing all in her might, not perfectly, to align herself with the son of promise. She's going to make some mistakes here, but look at her heart. Um, Jacob doesn't come off looking very admirable, but Esau doesn't either. We get the sequel to the birth story and what happens probably when they're teenagers of Jacob fearful that his father is not making this thing clear, that God has chosen Jacob to be the promised son who will carry on the line, and he wants to somehow cause that to be legally documented. So in a crazy way, he offers Esau something that he knows will appeal to this materialistic, stomach-driven ungodly man that Esau is already becoming. Esau comes in hungry and he gives up everything legally, apparently, with the wording here for a bowl of soup, a bowl of bean soup. Doesn't even have any beef in it or lamb. <laughs> bean soup. So scripture makes it clear in that last sentence in verse 25. So Esau showed that he despised his birthright. I think what they mean for us to see there is the spiritual part of that birthright. It didn't mean anything to him, and it apparently meant everything to Jacob. The New Testament verses that you looked up just commented on that as well, in case there's any doubt. Esau did not have the respect for that birthright, and his brother did. Well, so much for home life in chapter 26. We're going to see 
Isaac as a neighbor. But we're going back in time here because if you think about it, for Rebecca to seem beautiful and desirable, she probably wouldn't have been if she had two little ankle biters. <laughs> so this is a time before, and the commentaries say the reason it's put here is to help us understand God's blessing to Isaac. I'm so scared I'm going to say the wrong names, and I probably will, but you'll know who I'm talking about. So just that, that the narrator wants us to get the meaning of that blessing, the meaning of the relationship with God, which will come out here. So Isaac goes... Um, to Gerar. Famines were pretty rough in the promised land, but Egypt had the Nile River, and so it was mostly fertile there in times of famine, not 100%, but an easy place to run to when you felt like you needed help. So God catches Isaac en route to Egypt. He's going to go through the land of the Philistines first, and God stops him. Wait, stop. Don't go any farther. So he stops, but he still doesn't do it right. He is following in many ways his father for good and for bad, doing the same thing that Abraham did when he had a famine, but God stops him. And I just want you to notice one of the things that God says here, because it comes up again and again and again. In verse 3, stay in this land for a while, I'll be with you, I'll bless you, for to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and confirm the oath to Abraham. I will give you all these lands. God never fails to repeat that the gift of the land to this promised line that will be a nation someday this is a gift he repeats over and over. And when you look at our news today, the struggles going on in the Middle East, it is hearkening back to them clinging with all they have to this promise that they believe irrevocably given to them by God for this land. And they are going to go down fighting for it. Um, so... Isaac repeats the same promise of Abraham. Commentaries are divided as to whether this is the same Abimelech. Some point out, well, there have been a lot of years that have passed. because it, Could it possibly be the same guy? They also point, and you can Google Abimelech and discover that it was a name kind of like Caesar that was given generically to kings or rulers. So it's not necessarily the same guy, but he's had the same deception when Isaac tries to pass off Rebekah as his sister and not his wife. And then God causes Isaac in very visible ways to be showing the blessing God's given him. Verse 12, he plants crops that reap a hundredfold. His wealth is growing, his hot crops and herds and all of that. It, the servants are probably getting bigger and bigger, and there's a lot of jealousy. We've picked that up before the story of Lot and Abraham and the jealousy of the herdsmen. Only here, when the Philistines are envious, what do they do? They start filling up the wells that Isaac was going to for water. They can't use them. This is pure spite. They're just trying to drive him away and be uh, ugly to him. They want him to move away. Isaac Instead of creating a big hubbub, instead of going after them or causing a war, he just moves to the next place. He finds fresh water there because God is with him. They come fill those wells up. He moves to the next place. In the midst of all this, which I think is such a lesson for us, I don't think it proves true 100% of the time. There are some issues that do have to be addressed. But for so many of the issues that come into our lives, would it not be better to trust God and just move to the next place? Trust God to bless there instead of making a huge hubbub over something. And that's what Isaac does. He just peacefully moves to the next place and trusts the Lord to give him new wills. God seems to affirm this in three ways. First of all, um, God comes to him himself and reiterates his promise in verse 23. Isaac builds an altar there. His servants begin digging yet another well. Secondly, Abimelech and his advisors come, and they have seen. It says, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. 
they realize God is with this son too. And we want to be on the right <laughs> side of this powerful God and his son. So they ask for a treaty, which Isaac gives them. And then the third thing, after he has made that treaty, the servants come running in verse 32 to say, hey, you know that well we were digging? Fresh water again. So God has his ways of showing his affirmation when we are making right choices. The principle, if we will only let him, God will take care of our injustices in his own way and in his own time. If we will only let him, God will take care of our injustices in his own way and in his own time. So there are times I've done that well. There are times I've done that terribly. There's a line in the, the book, the movie, Emma, that comes back to me again and again. Um, Jane Austen's book, Emma, I don't know if you've ever read it, but she's kind of a persnickety character. And Emma says something very unkind about one of her neighbors. Her dear friend, Mr. Knightley, who's been faithful and loving to her since the time she was a baby, he's that much older, he looks her square in the eyes and he says, Badly done, Emma. If you've ever heard that from somebody you love, from a faithful friend whose wounds can be trusted, it pierces your heart. God is our faithful friend and his wounds can be trusted. When he says badly done, here he says basically, well done, well done, Isaac. I would much rather hear that. Often in my head I hear, badly done, Christy, badly done. <laughs> oh. But is there an injustice that we need to give to God today? And will we be that faithful friend who can do such a thing lovingly? Correct. The battle for the blessing is in Genesis 27, but before we get there, we have a little bit of a prelude at the end of <coughs> verse 20, no, let's see, chapter 26, where it says that Esau married two Hittite women. That's just to clue us in. We've already had some clues. Esau is not going to be a godly man. He doesn't get godly things. He just, he's not there. So anyway, when we get to this terrible story, each character is seen as worst, every one of them. They're all trying to manipulate something. But keep in mind that God has set in place what will happen. And they are all, in some degree, not trusting God to, to carry that out. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I hate that. It's true. Um, we don't want to look at this story. I just hate the story. I really do because I just see myself in it all over the place. Let's look at the characters. Let's look at the birthright and the blessing. We'll start off with Isaac. It would seem that in his older age, love of food and comfort and self-will have dulled his spiritual senses. He wants what he wants, and he has let himself forget, or he is just simply trying to circumvent God's edict about the sons. He wants that blessing to go to the son he favors. And ironically, he thinks he's on his deathbed, y'all. He's going to live for 43 more years. Uh, mm. He was old. He was physically blind. He was certainly spiritually blind. The birthright and blessing, I really spent some time trying to figure this out, trying to separate what it was in the culture between what it was in this particular family because it's a little bit different. This family has a God-given birthright for a line that is going to stretch through time and ultimately change the world. So it makes it different. Um, but the birthright meant leadership in the family, at least a double portion of earthly goods. In this case, it would require it would mean all the blessings that have been given to Abraham being passed down. So those blessings, reminder, the land, a seed, a, 
progeny, children who would become a nation. The promise would also mean a relationship with God in this family that the rest of the world would not share in but would learn about and be invited into because of this family, that they would be a means of blessing the entire earth. That's the birthright. And you can see which parts of that we think Esau is probably completely ignoring, um, and maybe Isaac too. The blessing that Isaac is giving is cementing as the father through his words at his deathbed, which isn't his deathbed, but he is cementing the birthright going to the son, supposedly, that God has chosen, only he's not. When you read these stories, especially when you get to Jacob and his 12 sons, you realize sometimes the blessing that they are giving is prophecy they themselves will not understand in their lifetimes. You'll really see this when we get to Jacob. The gifts that they are passing on are not theirs to give. And here's where Jacob, Isaac, made his terrible mistake. Isaac thought, that he could switch it around. But they weren't his gifts, they were God's gifts, and God had already chosen the son that they would go to. All the more wrong for him to try to redirect it. So Rebecca, with all her faults, still, she's more discerning about the heart and the spiritual part of her sons than her husband is. She is aware that Esau is unfit for the spiritual mantle She's already gotten the prophecy, and she's seeing him live out the fact that he is not fit for what has been denied him since before birth. His wives are driving her crazy. Um, she plots to make things right. She so desperately wants to make things right, but she does it in a wrong way. Have you ever tried to jiggle things for the good of your children? for the good of your husband. You can understand, if not condone, what she's done. She is what we might say today, she's trying to be junior Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, how God might have worked the situation out, we don't know. Would he have? Absolutely. There is. He, he has to have worked it out because he had already said how it would be, but nobody was waiting for God to work it out. They're all trying to take it in their own hands. And when Rebecca, in her finagling, says, may the curse fall on me, it will. It will, in a terrible way, because she's not going to see her son after he leaves, not before her death. She will never see him again. Jacob is a boy who knows what should happen, a man, um, he's not seeing the spiritual leadership in his home. He's fearful, surely, at this time. He doesn't know. Is it possible that Isaac is going to reverse what God had said would happen? Could that be? <laughs> that would be his fear anyway, that all these years he's been anticipating this birthright, this blessing, and that by words that his father might said it it might lock in something into place that isn't the way it should be. So he goes right along with it. He tells lies. He pretends to be someone he's not. He even brings God into it, which is just horrible. But to me, one of the worst things in here is where Isaac says, come here, my son, and kiss me. Ugh. And he comes forward and gives him a kiss. And I think of that other betrayer we know who betrayed with a kiss. Ugh. Esau, in some ways, feels the most painful. His cries, oh, bless me, me too, my father. That cry, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. And he's weeping out loud. Isaac and Esau were definitely on the wrong side of things. They're both quick to blame Jacob for his trickery, but what were they both doing? They just got out tricked. They were trying to pull something, and it got pulled on them instead. I think of that verse, those who try to dig a pit will fall into it themselves, and that has happened. 
Esau's sense of loss is probably more for the material gain. And when I look here at the actual blessing that Isaac gave to him, it's all about material gain. May God give you heaven's dew, earth's richness, abundance of grain, new wine, and power. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you, be Lord over your brothers. May those who curse you be cursed, those who bless you be blessed. Where in here is anything about being a blessing to the world, about carrying on spiritual truths to a needy planet of people who don't know God? Nothing about that in here. So I think that is what they're thinking about. Interesting, too, that when Abraham died, he had already given a lot of his material goods, it says, to the other children and sent them away. And then when he died, it says everything he left then to Isaac. But here, it seems that Isaac thinks he's going to die, and he hasn't prepared for any of that. So he he thinks he's just going to give everything. And truly, once he says it, it is locked in. So the only blessing, if you want to call it, for Esau is a pretty sad one. Your dwelling will be away from the earth's riches, away from the dew of heaven. You'll live by the sword, serve your brother. When you go restless, you'll throw his yoke mm -hmm. off from your neck. Esau's home would be kind of a desolate place, red cliffs. His descendants are going to be burrs in the blanket of Israel for generations to come. There are going to be trouble for Israel when Moses is leading them through the desert. They are going to be trouble for Israel in the days of the kings. And right on into the New Testament, if you track it, the children of Esau, the Edomites, they're called Edomians in the New Testament. The last known people in that line are the Herods. And look at what they did. The first one killed all the babies in Bethlehem to try to wipe out the Messiah. His son, the second one, took the head off John the Baptist. And the third one in the line killed the Apostle James and arrested Peter. And then they just seemed to die off the face of the earth. But all the whole line, they all seem to be characterized by trying to thwart the purposes of God. I think back here of Isaac at the end, when it says in verse 33, he trembled violently. Some have thought he was trembling in anger. I think he was trembling at the realization of what he had tried to do. He had tried to take a, a holy purpose that God had given him to pass something precious on and pervert it. And I think it hit him like a ton of bricks and he is just shaking with the knowledge of what he's done. He can't put the toothpaste back in the tube for his actions. He was in the wrong place. Principle, God's purposes will stand no matter what. God's purposes will stand no matter what. Don't be deceived. God will not be mocked. And our question is only, when will we yield to what God is doing? Or will we try to resist it? Will we surrender or not? Maybe there's a place of <laughs> surrender that's sitting before you today. Last section, last pictures of these four people. Last picture of Rebecca. She realizes at the end of chapter 27 that the only way of safety for her son is to send him away. A twofold thing happens, though, in this. By sending him away, he will be safe. And secondly, he will be able to go back and find a bride from the family that is outside the Canaanites, which will be helpful. It's a 500-mile journey, though, and it will be a great sacrifice for her, but she knows at all costs he needs to be protected, and he needs to have a wife who will be the right wife for him. So last picture of Isaac. Isaac does a 180, and this softens my heart toward him. It should yours, too, because when he realizes he was wrong, he does the next right thing. He calls Jacob in, and he gives him the true blessing from his heart, knowing that this is no trick. This is Jacob, and he gives him the blessing. 
that he should have given him all along. And a last picture of Esau, pretty sad. We don't know exactly, was Esau just being clueless? Did he think that, oh, they want me to marry somebody in the family, so I'll go make my third wife the daughter of Ishmael. That is really clueless. It tells you something, again, about the spiritual state of Esau. But it also could be that he's thinking, oh, you want family? I'll give you family. <laughs> and he marries the daughter of Ishmael, so we don't know which. Um, and last, Jacob, who sets out in chapter 28, pretty pathetically, he's won, but it is a hollow, horrible victory. He's lost everything. We don't have any indication he has a tent. We don't see any servants around. We don't see any worldly goods. He's got a 500-mile trip ahead of him on foot, all alone, through the desert, with all the guilt of having done something so bad. And he's a homebody, and here he is away from home. Uh, he stops that first night at a place called Luz. It tells us to make it even sadder, a stone for his pillow. He may not be your favorite character, but gosh, it, it does tug at your heart. He's miserable. But who is the friend of the miserable? Who is the friend of the lonely? Who is the friend of the sinner who realizes they're wrong? Who comes to meet him and introduce himself to this one who will go on with him and for him, it is the Lord. Jacob dreams of a stairway. Your version may say ladder, any regard. It's a portal into heaven. And Jacob is given this vision. All these years he struggled and worked and strived to be a part of what God was doing. And it backfired in his face. God <laughs> unfolds it as a gift, which it always is. It can never be attained through striving or struggling. It is always grace. It is always a gift. A stairway showing his connection. Angels are coming up and down it. God comes to him at his most helpless. No wonder that Jesus picks this story up when he talks to Nathaniel. He is that stairway. He would have us know. He is that stairway to heaven, to the Father, the only one, the only way to the Father. And now Jacob takes that very stone and he pours oil on it and he sets it up as a pillar and he calls the place Bethel, house of God. Um, the pouring of the oil on the stone is symbolic through scripture of pouring your life out to the Lord. He is worshiping here with all that he understands and knows, which is in everything. He is pouring out himself to the Lord. He is so awed when he wakes up. Surely the Lord is in this place and I wasn't aware of it. Mm. Have you been there when you've gone through something hard and you're looking back and you're looking forward? The realization that God is in this place. He hasn't left you. He says, I won't leave you. I won't abandon you. I'm going to bring you back to this land. Oh, he is so grateful. He's so touched. And the stone becomes a place of worship. That's meaningful. At the end, he makes a vow to God again. What, what does this mean? If we look at him with a jaded eye, we say, Oh, he's just making a deal with God. If you do this for me, then I'll do this. Well, maybe. But maybe on the other hand, there's another use of the word if that is like the word since. Since you are doing these things for me, God, here is what I want to do for you. And I want to take it that way. I want to take it from a grateful heart that that is what he means to say here. He is at a place of a new beginning with God. 
He's moved from a man who so wanted to be a part of God's work in the world, but didn't know how, did it the wrong way, to someone who now knows God himself, and he is going to go forward and make more mistakes. But now he knows God. God's kindness and grace have met him at the worst place in his life. God has promised he'll never leave him or forsake him, no matter what. So, like with all of us, the work of transformation is going to be a work in progress, but here's a principle. In the Lord's hands, failures aren't fatal. In the Lord's hands, our failures are not fatal. And in the Lord's hands, our failures can actually become new beginnings. Failures can be new beginnings. Um, I came across that principle from some studies that I'd done a long time ago, and it just came back to me again today very powerfully that failures are not fatal, not mine, not yours, not your children's, not anybody else that you love. Those failures are not fatal when they're in God's hands. They can be new beginnings, and that is good news. Life doesn't give us delete buttons much as we wish. Um, what God does with our painful missteps is he's so gracious when we turn to him, when we give them to him, he can turn them into places of new beginnings, and we too will be able to say, wherever we are in that process, if you know him, Surely God is in this place, even when we're not aware of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your goodness never more powerfully seen than when they are juxtaposed against our sin. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.